Sveiki, myliai, Delfi TV transliacijų žiūrovai, mes ir vėl tesime mūsų pokalbius iš mūsų studijos ir Pašnikovas, kurio pranešimo reikėjo paklausyti. Didžiulė minė žmonių klausė jo pranešimo ir turime garbės įturėti mūsų studijoje, tai yra Stevas Murphys, kovos su narkotikų prekyba buvęs agentas ir šiuo metu daranti savo pranešimus apie garsųjį narkotikų prekyvį Pablo Escobarą ir jo sulaikymo bei nukenksminimo istorijos. So, Steve, good to have you here in our studio. Thank you very much for having me. How do you like Lithuania so far? How do you like the crowd here in Logan Festival? You know what I told the crowd? I don't think I've ever met nicer people. I just right. got here yesterday, and it's everywhere I go. Everybody is so nice. You have, I think you people are probably the nicest people in the world here. I love okay. it. I love okay. it. Okay, good to hear that. Good to hear that. <laughs> How many presentations like these have you done in your lifetime after serving as a DEA agent? Well, uh, Javier and I retired from DEA in 2013. Um, we were doing a few, but as you can guess, once Narcos came out, yeah, it our business really picked up. So uh, last year in 2016, we did about 75 presentations. This year will probably be closer to 100. It's okay. just amazing. The, I mean, who ever thought I'd get to come to Lithuania and talk about Pablo Escobar? This is outstanding. We got the best retirement jobs in the world. Man. Okay, okay, I can see that. Okay, let's talk about Narcos. How has your life changed after airing Narcos? Well, um, a lot of people, you know, I can walk through airports and nobody knows who I am. Only after we do a presentation do people know who we are. So it's not like we're movie stars or famous or anything like that. It's it's a retirement job, but it's developed into a really busy retirement job. Um, you know, Monday Monday and Tuesday, Javi and I were in North Carolina. We drove home Tuesday night, and then Wednesday we came to Lithuania. I'll get home Saturday night, and then Monday I head to Miami for a week. We're going to film a new show down there, and it just every week there's something going on. But I'm not complaining. This is all good. Have you ever done any consulting job for the show or crew? Yep. Um, We, when we retired from DEA, Netflix hired us as consultants for the first two seasons. So we had contracts and they, they paid us for information. And, and, you know, we would help them try to make scenes more authentic. And we told them all the true stories. And that's what we did. We told the truth. Yeah, okay. Now, a lot of what you see in, in Narcos on the show, is, there's a lot of Hollywood added in, in there. Yeah, I um, wanted to ask you a question about that. How much of a dramatization is in the Narcos show? Let me put it like this: about a third of the show is accurate. A third Only of the show. Only third of the show. Yeah. Well, then the next third is kind of true. It happened, but maybe not quite the way it's depicted. And then the last third is just Hollywood make believe. But you know what? They they made a great action series. I, yeah, mean, I love course. the show. I'm real happy with it. Uh, how much of a dramatization is in your character in the Narcos? I mean, the Steve Murphy, which is depicted in the. That show. Well, you know how they uh, every scene, either um, Boyd Holbrook plays me and Pedro Pascal plays Javier. Every scene, the first thing to do is light a cigarette and drop the F word. Neither one of us even smoked. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess that's a Hollywood thing that you know makes you look like a tough guy if you light a cigarette. I don't know. And the drinking in the office, we didn't do that. You, know, so you weren't allowed to do that yet. No, no, you get fired for things like that. You know? <laughs> okay. So, but you know, Boyd, I, I don't think they could have found anybody that played a better role. We've we've become pretty good friends, and um, I'm real happy with the way he portrayed me. I have no complaints. Nice. Okay, nice to hear that. Okay, let's talk about your uh, time that you served in Colombia as the agent. Uh, of course, first of all, it was like a, an order to go to Colombia. Yeah. <laughs> Was that a hard solution in your life, a decision to make in your life, to go to Colombia and to serve there? You know, actually, I wasn't ordered. It's a vol we have to volunteer. Oh, to only go volunteer, overseas. yeah? So my wife and I had been in Miami for four years in the 1980s, and it, it was very violent during that time. Uh, I had a partner that was shot in a deal. We had an informant that was killed. I mean, there was a lot of violence going on in Miami anyway. But I was obviously much, much younger than I am now. And my wife, is she's a nurse, and she likes... Um, She likes all the trauma things that go on the ICU and the emergencies that go on. Likes to be in action, yeah. Yeah, and I think it's the grossest thing ever. But she loves that. And so after four years in Miami, she came to me once a day and she said, "Okay, so what's the next most exciting thing we can do in our lives?" And we talked about it, and I said, "Let's go to Colombia." She said, "Okay." So she wasn't all resistant at all. Not at all. It, it was as much her idea as it was mine. And I, you know, I give her credit because. The show depicts her in season two that she left Columbia and left yeah. me down there by myself. She took the baby. That's not true. She never left my It side. didn't happen at all. She has always been with me. Nice. She actually got really mad about that. <laughs> she called the, uh, 
Well, the executive producer, I was talking to him one day, and she got on the phone with him, and she kind of chewed him out. You know, she, so how she did you sugarcoat all the situation? No, uh, hey, he, he developed the situation. He has to explain it to her. Don't blame me. Yeah. <laughs> okay, okay, Steve, I wanted to ask you a question. How was, what was your role in that all the elimination of the Pablo Escobar process? Well, once he surrendered to his prison, um, you know, we, it gave me a year to learn all about Pablo Escobar. I knew who he was, but not, I never dreamt I'd be working a case directly on him. Yeah. But that's what DEA's job is, is we go for the biggest traffickers in the world, the highest level traffickers. So when he escaped, um, we call it putting the band back together. We got all the investigators that participated in the first manhunt. They're really good people. Got the government of Columbia to bring them back in. And Javier and I actually moved to Medellin and lived with the police up there. So, you know, I left my wife and our, our newly adopted daughter, our first daughter, in Bogota. Javier had to leave his life in Bogota. And we went up and we, we lived with the Columbia National Police. We ate the same food. We slept in the same conditions. We drank the same nasty alcohol that they drink down there. Uh, we faced a lot of the same dangers they faced, but not nearly as many as they did. Okay. And if there's if there's one message that I want people to remember about this whole thing is, it's you know people call you a lot of names as a police officer, and most of the time it's not a good name. Yeah. But people hear our show now, and and they come up to Javier and I and say, man, it's nice to meet a hero. You guys are true heroes. We're not heroes. And that's we don't want anybody. To, I mean, it's nice that they call you that, yeah. but. That's not our objective. The true heroes are the Columbia National Police. Because, you know what, at the end of my tour of duty, I got to go back to the United States where it was safer. I mean, safer than Columbia anyway. Okay. Um, they didn't. They had to continue to live there with their families who could be targets. When Pablo killed people, he just didn't kill you. He come after your wife, your children, your mother, your father, your in-laws. He took out all fam whole fi families, entire families. So uh, what we say is the Columbia National Police actually took their country back. They did what had to be done, whether you agree with it or not, the method that they used. In my opinion, there was no other end that could have been met that would be justified other than killing Pablo Escobar. How hard was it for you to work in Colombia as a like white male from America, like a yeah. green, gringo? Yeah. What it, was the reaction from the Colombians? They didn't want to talk to you. Did, did you know Spanish <clears throat> back then? Well, the uh, U.S. government sent me to the language school for six months to learn how to speak Spanish. The problem was they taught me how to speak proper Spanish. I don't speak proper English. <laughs> so I could talk to them, and they understood everything. But then when they would answer back in colloquial sayings or their everyday Spanish, I yeah. would get lost. Yeah, yeah. So it took me a while to catch up to that. Um, um, and I just forgot the second part of your question there because I was thinking so about the Spanish. So did they collaborate with you? But uh, Oh, yeah. Uh, so when I got there, Javier, I spent three years in Colombia. Javier spent six and a half years. So he had already been there for three years. Yeah. He had earned their respect. And so simply because he vouched for me as his partner, they accepted me. They trust you, yeah. They, they do to a degree. You still have to do things to earn their respect. But you've got to show them that, you know, if a firefight starts, that you won't run away. But you know what? They never ran away either. So they, they, we give them a lot of credit with keeping us alive down there. It's a mutual respect from both sides, yeah? It is. It is. And, and we earned each other's respect. Okay. Uh, another question is that uh, in Narcos, sometimes uh, Pablo Escobar is depicted like a hero of Colombia, like a hero for uh, regular people. He helps uh, his hometown, the people. Uh, did uh, some at some point these regular people harden your case, uh, like by hiding uh, some clues, some evidence, some some people that you needed to interrogate, and so on? There were a lot of people down there loyal to Pablo Escobar, but <clears throat> so let's look at the situation. He has this persona of being a Robin Hood, and there's nothing further from the truth than him being Robin Hood. Yeah. Now, did he go in and build free housing for people that actually lived on a trash dump? He did. That's true. So now if you're, if you're living on a trash dump and now somebody's giving you a free place, you've got a roof over your head, you've got running water, you've got electricity, things that we take for granted, yeah, yeah, yeah. you've got a lock on your door so now you have a little bit of security for you and your family, what would you think of the guy? How would you be, be mad at that guy? Right. Did, he, did he build clinics? He did. Did he build soccer fields for the kids? Yes. Did he give money away? Did he give food away? He did all those things. And those things in themselves are very good things. But... He expected a payback, and this is what never gets published. And this is one of the messages that Javier and I like to get out, is Pablo was nothing more than a master manipulator. He manipulated these people. So when he needed, 
let's say he's got 500 Sicarios or assassins yes. working for him. And, and for example, let's say 100 have been killed in firefights with the government. So he comes back up to the barrio and he's, when he shows up, everybody hugs him and kisses him and he's giving money out. Yeah. And he says, guys, I need 100 volunteers, people who are willing to die for me. Well, the sad thing was maybe 400 people would step up. Because, I mean, think about it. If he had put a roof over your mother's head, would you do anything for that man? It seems like so, yeah. But would you die for him? These kids did. And these are kids. Javier uh, interviewed a 15-year-old, you want to say he's a kid, but he was a thug. And he, he openly talked about what his roles were working for Pablo Escobar. He admitted to Javier killing that he had killed himself 10 Colombian police officers. We said, why did you do that? He said, well, I get paid $100 for every Colombian policeman that I kill. So a Colombian police officer's life is only worth 100 bucks? It's ridiculous. And, and Javier said, what do you do with the money? He said, you know, most of the money goes to my mother. You know, I want to take care of her. As long as I've got new tennis shoes, a pair of jeans, and a little bit of drinking money, she gets the rest. Okay. And, he, and so Javier said, what do you think your life's going to turn into? And he, says, he starts laughing. He said, we know we're not going to live very long. Our life expectancy, we might make it to 22 years old. And if we do, that's a long time for me. I know I'm going to die someday for Pablo Escobar, but I'm willing to do it. All right. It's just scary. So that, that Robin Hood persona, there's nothing further from the truth. He manipulated those people to get what he needed. So Steve, how many death traps have you got during your work in Colombia? Well, Pablo put a, he put a bounty on Javier and I that was uh, $300,000 for All each right. of us. So uh, Javier actually had to change apartments twice because we would get threats coming in. Yeah. They had found out where he lived in Bogota. So you'd think he would move back to the United States, but you know, he wouldn't go. He stayed. So he just changed apartments, lived in a different part of town. And, this, and Bogota is a city of about 8 million people. So you, know, you can hide pretty good there. Uh, for me, I can't hide. I'm, my, you know, my background, I'm English, Irish, I'm about as white as you get. I've got light colored eyes. You know, I don't blend in in Colombia. <laughs> yeah, Colombian, yeah. Yeah, but um, the Colombian police really went out of their way to protect us. And, uh, you know, honestly, uh, I'm a Christian and I believe it's by the grace of God that I survived and Javier survived. So. Um, it's nice to hear your story from your well, side. Well, thank you. Uh, well, a question. Have you ever seen Pablo Escobar with your own eyes uh, during that your stint in Colombia? Only the day he died. So all the photographs, I took all the photographs for, for whatever reason. I had the only camera that worked out there that day. Um, we had done a lot of surveillance on his wife and children. Uh, you know, they were trying to get out of the country. He wanted to, at one point, he was going to send them to Miami. <clears throat> and his wife and two children had visas to come to the United States. How does Pablo Escobar's family get visas to the United yeah. States? So it just so happened that when they showed up at the airport, Javier was there in Medellin. He saw him, called the ambassador, told him what was happening. The ambassador ordered him, ripped the visas out of their passports so they couldn't come to the United States. And he did. That's what Javier did. And then, as you know, the story, he then tried to take him to Frankfurt, Germany. Yes, yes. And uh, we were able to exert pressure on the German government through our White House in Washington so that when they arrived, uh, they were put in quarantine, and the next morning they were put on a flight right back to Bogota. Back to Bogota. But the reason we were worried about that is because Pablo had already made the boast, the statement, that if I could get my family into a safe area where I don't have to worry about their safety, I'm going to declare a war on Colombia like you've never seen. He's already declared war on his own country twice, and he's going to declare a third war? We That's didn't want to see it. We didn't want to see it. it. It would have been horrible. You know, in law enforcement, we had never seen car bombs. Those are terrorist activities. Hmm. So we credit Pablo with being the world's first narco-terrorist. You know, that, that was things that you saw against insurgent groups, you know, the, the guerrillas, the, the FARC, the M19, the different groups that were down there, ELN, AUC. Uh, he introduced a new level of violence in law enforcement that we had never seen before. Steve, uh, maybe you know, of course, that Pablo Escobar's son is doing his uh, book presentation, his book tours around the world. He was in Lithuania this year, so have you ever contacted him? Have you ever had a chance to talk to him about, well, those times? No, and we won't. Um, of course. A couple weeks ago, we, we did a two-week Scandinavian tour. We were in Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Finland, the Netherlands, and Iceland. And before we went on that, our agent called me one day, and he said he just got a call from, pa from Juan Pablo's agent and wanted to know, would we be willing to go on stage with him? Together. Right. And just so you know, hell no, we won't do it. And that's what I told my agent, and, and he, they understand. Uh, and we told him, if, if I'm on stage and he shows up, I'll walk off. 
if if we get to the theater and he's there, we won't even go on stage. Okay. Now he's written a book called Sins of the Father, and and I hate for him to know this, but I actually read the book. Um, he tries to portray that his father committed suicide. His father didn't commit suicide. Yeah, he was course. killed in a firefight with the Columbia National Police. But excuse me, what what Juan, what Juan Pablo is trying to do is change the legacy of his father saying, well, my dad said he would always commit suicide before he'd let the government officials take him. I'm, before I was a DEA agent, I was a local police officer for 12 years. I was trained in murder investigations and suicide investigations. I've worked both. There are telltale signs when someone commits suicide with a gun. And, and basically there's powder burns on, on yes. whatever area if they shoot themselves here. Well, Pablo was shot in the ear. Even if he had held the gun here, this far out, the, the powder would have traveled that far, so it, it would have sent the skin. Them, yeah. Right. There were absolute, you can look, you go online, look the photographs. They're, they have been published all over the world. There's no powder burns on the side of his head. So that's simply not true. Also, his explanation of what happened after his father was killed is in direct conflict with what the Columbia National Police told us that happened. So I found it interesting to hear his explanation, but I don't believe it. I it's only like a matter Nashville of justification, police. like of his father's sins, yeah. It is, and it, I mean, you can, if you think about that, um, I mean, he, he and his mother and, and his little sister, his little sister, she's innocent. You know, that poor little kid, she, she hadn't done anything to anybody when Los Pepes and the Cali Cartel attacked their building in Medellin, the Monaco building, and she lost part of her hearing as a result yes. of that. And I think she was only five years old, so that's, <clears throat> that's horrible that she got caught up in this. And even Juan Pablo, when he was younger, it was horrible that he had to endure that. But you know what? They all benefited from the spoils of what their father was doing. All that money, I mean, Forbes magazine estimated his net worth at between eight and 30 billion, not million, billion, billion dollars. Billion. So <clears throat> I can understand that they had to give a lot of the assets to the Cali cartels to keep themselves alive, but I, I just don't think it happened the way he described it. Now, I wasn't there. You know, but I believe what the Columbia National Police told me. So, Steve, thank you. We have a pressing time, but it was an honor to talk to you. Thank you very much. I appreciate you having me on here. Thank you. Thanks.